Welcome to Episode 8 of Quiltside Chats. Brought to you by American Quilt Study Group. The American Quilt Study Group establishes and promotes the highest standards for interdisciplinary quilt-related studies, providing opportunities for study, research, and the publication of works that advance the knowledge of quilts and related subjects. In partnership with the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the International Quilt Museum's mission is to build a global collection and audience that celebrate the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. And sponsored by Quilt Folk, a quarterly keepsake magazine of, by, and for quilters. Quiltside Chats are a series of lively conversations between Carolyn Ducey, International Quilt Museum Curator of Collections, and an American Quilt Study Group member featuring the quilt that she or he would sneak out of the building if it weren't a crime. Lisa Evans studied medieval English literature and American history at Smith College. Since the early 1990s, she's researched, written, published, and lectured on quilts and textiles of the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and early modern Europe at quilt guilds, reenactments, and academic conferences. She has published two articles in Boyden and Brewer's annual journal, Medieval Clothing and Textiles, a paper on the interaction of experimental archaeology and historic reenactment with academic scholarship in the proceedings of the Societas Ionis Higinesis, and a short article on early 16th century pieced clothing in a recent issue of Blanket Statements. Her most recent paper regarding two Indo-Portuguese quilted capes in the Metropolitan Museum and the Cooper Hewitt appeared in Refashioning Medieval and Early Modern Dress, a tribute to Robin Netherton in 2018. Lisa focuses her current research on the possible influence of early modern pieced clothing on early patchwork, late medieval wool applique, and Indo-Portuguese needlework in the West. Carolyn Ducey is Curator of Collections at the International Quilt Museum, a position she has held since 1998. She oversees acquisition and management of the IQM collection of more than 8,500 quilts. Ducey earned an MA in American Art History from Indiana University in 1998 and her PhD in textiles, clothing, and design with an emphasis in quilt studies at the University of Nebraska in 2010. She is co-editor of American Quilts in the Industrial Age, 1760 to 1870, published in 2018, and a co-author of What's in a Name, Inscribed Quilts, published in 2012. And now, let's cozy up to the quilt. Hi everyone, welcome. Here we are the first day of spring and we have such a special quilt and such a special um, speaker today. Lisa, I'm so excited to hear what you have to say about this really unusual quilt in our collection. Thanks, Carolyn. That was a great introduction. And isn't that a wonderful quilt? I mean, as you can see by looking at the background, I my house really needs some freshening up. <laughs> and, you know, two years of the pandemic, quarantine, I have cats. We all have, you know, we all know what that's like. And when I was first asked to be on this, I went through the collection and I saw this beautiful little piece. And I thought, that is really charming. And wouldn't that look nice in a private home? I mean, I, I can't, um, can, I think we should go to the next slide because I want to show people the picture of the center of the oh there's a detail of the border I mean isn't that just the stitching on it is just so beautiful and so precise and if you go to the next slide you'll see one of the things that charms me the most which is that's the center medallion and isn't that elephant just the sweetest thing he reminds me of Babar you know, <laughs> those of us who went, yeah, what, those yeah, of us, you know, know. Babar the little and his Queen Celeste 
And that elephant reminds me strongly of Babar. I mean, he's just so cute. He's a little bit small for the size of the palanquin on his back, but he is just precious. Yeah. And I would love to have him. It also a, you know, I mean, I frankly, I specialize in quilts that are about a century older than this beautiful early 18th century quilt. But this is the closest I'm realistically going to get because I think it would be easier to sneak into the IQM than to sneak into the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Probably. And this one would probably, it would probably go fairly well with my decor. I, I mean, I, I promise I would keep it up on the wall. <laughs> I wouldn't let the cats near it. I, I oh, if it were up to me, Lisa, sure. What the heck? No. Oh, put it on. Put it on the bed. Let no. yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Let my long-haired cat, Gil the Wonder Cat, shed all over it. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would be very honored. I'm sure he would. It's a, and, you know, and seriously, this is a fantastic quilt. I mean. You can see some resemblances to earlier quilts, um, you know, to earlier quilts like the Indo-Portuguese um, export quilts that were so popular in Western Europe in the early modern period. But this one, it's just, you can see the later influence of, you know, of global trade. Because if you take a really good close look, you know, the you know, elephants are Indian. But, you know, go to the next slide. You can really see what I mean in that one. You'll see that there is, you know, right there. See, they don't have jet dragons that look like that in China. I mean, in India, that's a Chinese dragon. And, and if you look closely at the little gentleman in, that's sitting there in the little howdah, he doesn't look Indian either. Because that was one of the things that you saw all the time in the, I mean, for, for people who aren't familiar with this, with, a, with what I'm talking about with an Indo-Portuguese quilt, these were quilts that were made in India in the area around Goa and Hooghly. Um, in, basically, to, they were made to order for Portuguese traders who started arriving there in the late uh, 15th and the early 16th centuries. And they went to the local workshops and gave them pattern. You know, they started trading and they started bringing all these exotic stitched quilts to the West. And eventually they started giving the local workmen um, pattern books. That so, and they said, you know, make something that looks like this. So you, so we often have quilts from that time period where you'll have um, a very European design, like a pelican, you know, the heraldic symbol of the pelican in her piety, feeding her young on blood she plucks from her breast. And then all around her are gazelles and mongoose and lions and all kinds of exotic looking Indian animals. And you know, surrounding a very European looking pelican or a double headed eagle um, from that. It was the heraldic symbol of the Habsburg Empire. And then you'll have like an India, a large Indian rat or a couple of gazelles sort of dancing around it and, or men dressed is, dressed in Indian costume. And they've got um, European hunters with what are very clearly muskets. So how do you then put an, uh, an, a place of origin on these pieces? Because they are just a mix of all of these different cultures. So yeah. how, do we, how do we really begin to know? Are there certain clues you look for? Yeah, there, um, there are some clues. Um, I don't know how, how many, whoever was at the, um, I think there was, a, there was an AQSG meeting up in Manchester a few years ago. Do you remember that one? I was not there. Oh, okay. No, one of the papers that was presented was by Dana Bone, and she had found an Indo-Portuguese quilt um, in Spokane, Washington. And I was able to date it, and then the date was confirmed by someone in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, there were certain patterns with, you know, basically vine patterns and certain techniques and materials that are very common to Indo-Portuguese quilts. 
Uh, most of them were made of, they were linen, a linen top, a very thin layer of cotton as the batting. And then the backing was either a coarser linen or it was a cotton. And then they would be, you would have all the motifs like, you know, the lions, the tigers, the mongooses, things like that, all would be chain stitched using golden wild silk. And typically, um, can we go back one, can we go back to the, uh, yeah, to the second slot. Yeah, that one right there with the, with the elephant. As you can see, you can see that there's a, sort of a central design there, a certain uh, central image in the, um, and then you have the stitched elephant, and then you have all the decorative elements and the little dragon and what looks like butterfly. And all those would be done in chain stitch, very fine chain stitch. And then the background would be quilted in a grid pattern or it would be quilted in a running stitch. And you can often tell that, you know, you can see, you could tell very early quilts, especially the, the, the Indian ones that the Portuguese imported by, you know, by seeing the golden silk and the chain stitching, which was done with, um, it was done on a hoop with something with a type of specialized needle called a tambour. Mm -hmm. And those, and they were very densely embroidered. Um, you, there are a few of them that are polychrome silks, like red and blue, in addition to the yellow, but most of them are the yellow wild silk, which they also call tussar silk. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah, the, the yellow silk seems to show up in a lot of early pieces. Exactly, it was well. It, the some of the silk that they used. I mean, most of, most cultivated silk is white, but the wild silk can be yellow, and so they were just using the silk that had been cleaned and reeled off into that bright, bright gold. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you'll see a, an awful lot of the yellow silk quilts with the, some of the very early ones. And gradually, you know, gradually tastes changed. You started to see less and less Indian imagery in these quilts and more and more European imagery. You would see hunters, you know, the hunters would no longer be wearing Indian costume. The hunters would be wearing um, European doublets and trunk hose and tall steeple hats. And, but the guides would still be Indian. They'd still be wearing, you know, like loosely fitting trousers and long jackets. But the hunters, it would be like they were, you know, like in one of the, some one of those old 1930s or 40s movies that was set in the British, in British India, where you've got the faithful nine, native guide and bearer who takes the king of the Khyber rifles off into the jungle or something like that. It was a very early example of that. And then gradually the taste for that started to started to change. Um, I think the f my, I think the fifth slide actually is an example. No, that no. Oh no, it's the seventh one. The seventh slide shows an Indo-Portuguese quilt, and it's unfortunately that's not a, okay. You can actually you can actually see this is what the early ones from like from the 16th century through to the early to mid. 17th century and see what I mean. You can see the the central medallion. You can see how densely they're embroidered and you can see all the, an, you know, the native animals from India. And um, you can see, I think you can, you can see some of the, there are um, double headed eagles. They could be Habsburg heraldic symbols, but they also could be related to a Hindu Garuda bird. Some of the elephants might just be exotic elephants, or it might be a reference to the Hindu god Ganesha. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you'll see this kind of sort of sort of mashup of the images, and you can see how the native craftsmen applied what they knew and what they saw around them to something that would impress these strange men from Portugal who came in and were buying things. And I mean, they were, these were really common in India and the Portuguese would sometimes use them as ballast in their ships. They would just take them by the bales and they'd sell them to Europe and Europeans would be, ooh, exotic. Yes. And 
of course that you know a lot of them got used to death so we only have a handful of the you know we have some left in i think there's one in hardwick hall in england there are the two quilted capes in a similar style in new york city um and they've got about two dozen of them at the museum of antique arts in lisbon and I'm sure that there are, uh, there are others that show up on the antiques market or they're scattered in European collections or European historic houses. But I mean, considering how many the Portuguese imported, there really aren't all that many left. Well, but that's a shame. They're really fascinating to look at because the workmanship is incredibly fine. But, you know, just like with a regular quilt, sometimes you look at them and you could tell that more than one person worked on it. Mm hmm you know, the stitching can be very tight and very fine in one part of it and a little bit looser, excuse me, and a little, you know, and the tension isn't quite right in the in, so, you know, the hoop they used or whatever. So were these professionals in that were making them, though, or is it a home industry? No, this was this, the, there was a whole industry set up um, that had been developed before the Europeans actually got to India. It was called the Karkana system. And I think um, Patrick Finn did a paper for um, for the IQM a few years ago mm -hmm. on that. But they would basically be workshops that were set up with professional craftsmen in it. And I'm not sure if they were if it was all men or if men and women worked on it. I know that it's primarily women who make modern cantha quilts mm -hmm. in India. But these might have been male professionals. I'm not entirely sure on that. But they would come in and, again, the, the, you know, the Portuguese eventually started setting up their own carcanas and bringing their pattern books. And so some of the later ones that you see have things like explicitly religious imagery. Mm -hmm. You know, like they would, um, you know, and not just a pelican in her piety. Um, you would have something like, you know, the Judgment of Solomon. And, or you would have um, Western myths like the, like the Twelve Labors of Hercules. And but at the same time, you'd still have gazelles and mongooses. It's a fascinating um, kind of interconnection between these different yeah. cultures. Yeah, and if you you know, and if you go back to the to the very first slide, you can see how that particular out. You can see how this it's the same layout. Only, right. Yeah, you, know, you can see how the layout continued even though the style changed, and you can also see that the border is very similar in certain ways to the Indo-Portuguese look. Um, I think that was the second slide. You can see, you know, that very, very close, dense quilting with kind of a vine pattern. And then you can see the, the stitching in the background in the grid pattern, which is what you often saw in those Indo-Portuguese quilts. But the imagery itself is very different. And in the one that will, you know, that I think would look absolutely divine, in my hallway, um, it, if you go back to the, it, I, can't, I feel awful making Tara jump back and forth, but if you go back to the first slide, you can see that the background of the medallion isn't quilted. And you can see that in some place that the, actually the batting looks kind of lumpy. It has gotten kind of lumpy and it does really show in the photos, particularly you get a lot of those shadows from that lumpiness. Exactly. And I, and you know, at the same time, you can see that, you know, again, once again, you have the central medallion, you have the, you have the border and you have all the, you know, the exotic looking little designs like, the elephant and the dragon and exotic insects and animals and people. But for some reason, whoever made this didn't quilt the background in the medallion. And I have, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Um, but, you know, if, if, but, you know, you can, you can also see that instead of Indian imagery, um, if you go to uh, slide number four, you can really see Again, there's the there's the little dragon, and you can I see love him. Isn't he adorable? I mean, I don't know if you saw um, the the movie last winter, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a superhero movie. But there is, but one of the main characters at the end of it is a def, is a guardian dragon, and the guardian dragon in the movie has that same kind of sinuous look as this little dragon, 
next to the elephant. But they don't really have that many elephants in China. So, no. you know, you can, but you can see that this definitely looks, you know, the, the, the features of the man in the little howdah, the little house on top of the elephant, he definitely doesn't look Indian. He looks more Chinese. And you can really see that in the fifth slide too. Um, take a look at that one. See if, if you can close in and go a little bit closer in on that one. There's somebody looks Chinese or Japanese under a nice little parasol. And you can see these little sort of curly Q things, but you can also really tell that only the bat, only the figure has been quilted and the background. Yeah. It does. It's it yeah. what about all these stitches? When you look at the parasol that this figure is under, it's yeah. like a like a basket weave. And then it's like actually like a so some of it is just a stitched basket weave. Yeah. But then the the kind of the edges of the parasol have this really interesting almost net like surface. Yeah. Is that I something know. you see um in other Indo you don't see it in the Indo-Portuguese quilts, although you do sometimes see them using French knots and backstitch. I mean, a lot of the time, the actual motifs would be outlined in the backstitch. And if you look closely at this one, you'll see that that's the case in this quilt as well. The major motifs are all backstitch, which is actually, it's a very good way to quilt on linen and it seems to have been a very you know these way to quilt on linen from um from the time of the tristan quilt which is in the late 14th century up until at least the 1950s i found a woman's institute pamphlet from britain where they're talking about quilting on linen and they're and they tell you do the motifs in a backstitch and you know especially if you're going to be doing cord quilting or trapunto that the back stitch around the motifs is going to be a much more secure stitch. So that's what they seem to have done with the basic outlines. But I see, but you know, definitely the little parasol, it looks like the top of it is satin stitched. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely more texture to it. And especially that yeah. you know, basket weave look at the border. And, you know, you'll see that in some of the details in the older quilts, but most of it was the chain stitch or the back stitch. I mean, like I said, I still don't quite understand why this one, why the maker who, you know, whoever was doing this, whether it was a professional or an amateur, didn't quilt the background. Because you would think that professionals would know that you really, that you really do have to do the background as well as as well as just the motif. Yeah, and, and most are done with a lot more quilting. So this mm -hmm. is kind of an anomaly. So Lisa is asking us, were there similar quilts being made in homes at this time? Probably. There is a British, um, it was, it was, there was a, there's a British book. Um, I don't remember the title of it, but it was done as part of the British quilt search back in the 1990s. And there was a heavily embroidered, um, very beautifully stitched quilt from around this time period, from around 1710, 1720, something like this. I, I think it was connected with, um, I think it might've been connected to, uh, to um, the British colony in Ireland at the time, but there, it, there are references in the family letters to um, the women of the household buying the silks for the embroidery themselves. They spent something, some enormous sum on the silk, like 40 pounds, wow. which is the equivalent of hundreds of dollars today just on the stitching so some of them might have been made at home most of them probably were made by professionals but we know for you know we know that there are very talented amateur needle women and fine stitchery was definitely part of the education mm -hmm. of every well brought up upper class woman and a lot of middle class women at the time period um, I know they're, they're not quilted, but there is a famous set of needlework hangings that Mary Queen of Scots did at Hardwick Hall. And they are beautifully, you know, again, it's beautiful workmanship. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, I'm seeing something. Alice 
McElwain is asking, is the subject quilt linen or cotton? Um, I believe it's, it's cotton. cotton. Yeah. It's cotton. Yeah. Okay. It and it's a later English example. So from what we know, yeah. it, it was made in England. So it's very much in this vein of these early quilts, but it is not one of the Indo-Portuguese pieces. No, no, it's very so different. It's, it is, and I really do think that it's, it's such an interesting question to know if it was a professional or a woman at home, because I think if you saw something like this and you had design books, there were design books available, sure. you could make your own. Exactly. Um, and they were professional limners who would go from household to household and they would draw the designs for you if you didn't want to do it yourself but they you know we have pattern books going back as far as the 1500s and you know the the, the pattern books they're called model books you you know you could use the stitchery to embroider something or quilt something or make lace i mean they were designed to be done just for general needlework and so it's entire so i'm wondering if maybe at least the central medallion part was done by people at home and they just, for whatever reason, whoever made it got interrupted before she could pull the back off. Could be. Yeah. And because the because it, there is the background quilting on the border. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you seen the back of it? The back of it is very simple. Just another cotton, white cotton. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was, yeah, because I was, you know, I just, the first time I saw that, I thought, was the background, was the medallion made by the same people who did the border it does look like the way the border is applied it's such a separate part it, yeah. it's something that could have been done by someone else and added to the body of the quilt that's what i'm wondering about because they they were they did occasionally do something like that i mean we i've seen examples of you know like a petticoat that later got um you know that later was turned into a bed quilt mm-hmm and there's an example in the, in the Metropolitan Museum of a Chinese embroidery that was later used as the central panel um, for something that was quilted at home using a, using, um, a carnation silk French damask. Well, and, you didn't, didn't get rid of textiles, even if they were oh, out of style, you not. incorporated them into something new. Yeah. And a lot of the time um, that will... Um, there's a there's a quilt in Henry VIII's death inventory from 1547 where it's described as you know one red silk quilt very tor very torn in Mr. Weston his lodging. Mr. Weston was one of the court musicians, and obviously this very expensive red silk quilt had originally belonged to Henry or one of his children or one of his many many wives. And as it wore out, it went farther and farther down the food chain at the court until finally it was given to Mr. Weston. And even though it was torn, it was still something you put on the bed and something that could keep you warm. And so Mr. Weston probably used it until it just simply disintegrated. Mm -hmm. And there's a the, there's another one um, that's described as an old worn green silk counterpoint we were discussing it before before the presentation started and you have henry talking and the whoever took the inventory said you know that this was an old worn quilt and it had in the central part you had roses flower uh, you had roses and pomegranatus basically the roses of the tudor dynasty the pomegranate of catherine of aragon and around it was flower de luces so basically in the center of the quilt, you had Henry's heraldic device, Catherine's heraldic device, and around the border of the French heraldic device. And that doesn't make sense until you remember that Henry VIII was still putting in a claim to be the King of France. And, you know, was still, and still actually owned some, some part of, you know, some part of the area around Calais mm -hmm. on, the, on the Channel Coast belonged to England until good 12 years after Henry's death. It, it was finally reclaimed by France during the reign of his daughter, Mary. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you have this dynastic quilt, but even though it was old and worn and had the arms of his 
first long discarded wife <laughs> and he still kept it. You didn't throw it away even then. He passed yeah, it and even though he even though you know he got he had basically abandoned Catherine 20 years earlier, he still had that quote. Yeah. So it might well, you know, I would love to take a closer look and you know to, at some point if, if I ever get to Nebraska, I'd love to take another a really close look to just you know look at the stitching and look at the materials oh my gosh lisa you your expertise is amazing we definitely need you to come to look at our early oh books. oh my goodness this one is but like i said i really like actually let's go on to the next slide because i think there's another detail in there yeah you can see more of the of the background detail and you can see what i meant about that lumpy look mm -hmm. in the background because I mean, it is common, you know, you do the motifs first and then you fill in the background and it's clear. It is really that. interesting that the yeah. background isn't filled. I really hadn't thought about that that much, but um, it's so unusual to not quilt it and not really get it um, yeah. and make it more um, durable that way too. Yeah, exactly. And it, oh, and it makes me, it makes me wonder if it got washed at some point. Oh, I, I have a feeling, it, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it, it puckers like that. So it does yeah, look like it could have been. Yeah. Oh, you were talking about like the more the textured stitches. If you look in the upper, uh, from my perspective, the upper left hand corner, you can really see that with, you know, parts of the central medallion right there. Yeah, and it's, just, it's a type of stitching that I have not seen on other quilts, not even our other early pieces. So it's really interesting. That looks almost like stump work, which is like that padded raised stuff that was very popular in the reign of Charles the First. I mean, it looks like there's that might be a little bit of padding underneath that kind of basket weave stitch. Yeah. Really, really interesting. You here, so you can really take a good close look at it, Lisa. Yeah, because well, um, you were talking a lot um in your um slides about chinoiserie and that. Yeah. Fascination yes. with the exotic. Yes. I go on to the, if you could go on to the next slide, you can really, okay, that's the Indo Portuguese one. And let's go on to the next one because chinoiserie was something really, that really started to come into vogue in the late 16th through to the early 1700s. And it basically is European, inter, Europeans borrowing designs from you know, the increasingly popular Chinese and occasionally Japanese um, motifs, you know, Chinese porcelains were becoming very popular, Chinese furniture, Chinese silks, Chinese, you know, these were luxury objects, but they were becoming very, very popular. And you can still sometimes see them for sale. And an aunt of mine had, um, had a table in her foyer that was it was black and it had Chinese sort of pseudo Chinese designs or the 1950s version of Chinese designs. Right. And, but you can, you can really see that. I mean, I, I found this, this painting from 1742 by Francois Boucher, who is known for, there's, there's a very famous painting that he did of a woman being pushed in a swing and her, and her boyfriend. Yeah. The, that one, the, her boyfriend is pushing. Right, that one, I know. Yeah. It's very, very fluffy and very, very, the whole style became known as Rococo. And you can see some of that in this other painting by Boucher, because it's, this is what Europeans thought a Chinese garden looked like. Now, of course, most of them had never been to China. <laughs> exactly. This was kind of their perception or, or their uh, imagination. What, you know, and they, they were exposed to these elements, but they kind of added their own take on them. Yeah. They really did. And if you go to the next slide, you can see a couple more examples of, of how these entered the domestic spheres. You know, a, a painting by Boucher would have been owned by somebody in the French aristocracy, someone at the court of Versailles. But if you had money, you could get something like that 18th century silk textile that's on the left of this slide. So that's from the early 18th century. It's from a place in England called Cock Abbey. Excuse me, and you can look at that's used as, as bed hangings, and you can see it's this very beautiful. It's pro, I couldn't really tell if it was, it's probably painted silk or possibly woven, but it's these beautiful, sort of you know, exotic looking designs. And if you look on the right, you can see there's some Chinese wallpaper 
from Saltram Hall, which was about maybe 30 years later. And you can see all these, you know, sort of Asian looking people standing around against an exotic background. Um, you know, it was all that whole, it was that whole thing of it's the mysterious East and we must. And this is, this is a period when people are just getting exposed to the East exactly. and really becoming aware of their art and their design. And so it really did yeah. kind of sweep through Europe, particularly. Mm -hmm. And you can start to see it even in, you know, a lot of there were, there were textiles coming through, you know, like exotic silks. This is when we start to really see palampores hit in Europe in large quantities. And of course, they weren't Chinese, but they were from India. And that was considered the exotic and mysterious East. And a lot of, and it was like nothing that was being done in Europe because Europe at that time period, a lot of the traditional imagery was very, you know, it was still based on the neoclassicism of the Renaissance, you know, studying, you know, Greek and Roman designs. And then you, and then you have, um, all these, you know, then you basically you'll know, have something like Rubens with his floating angels, or some of those other, you know, like frescoes that you get in the 17th century, where you have mythological scenes from Greece, and then along comes these fascinating things that are completely different. I that think that it's just that that fascination with the unknown and with with lands that you've never seen it, it's something I, I think we still are fascinated with but mm -hmm. it really was yeah. such an incredible phenomenon and had such an impact on textiles well look what happened here in the united states after nixon went to china suddenly you had this huge fad for you know chinese for chinese motifs suddenly silk became cheap because we were, we were able to import it again for the first time in decades. So suddenly, instead of having polyester in all the stores, you started to see silk. You started to see, um, you know, designs from the, from, Mysteria, from the mysterious East printed on polyester double knits, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, and also that was, that was also about the time that, again, they were starting to import Indian, Indian print hangings. And if there's a college dormitory anywhere in the United States that doesn't have at least some of those on the wall or on the beds, I would be stunned because I know that you that when I was in college, we had them everywhere. People made bed curtains, you know, people made, oh, yes. made, made curtains because otherwise all yeah, all you get at, you know, at Smith, the big seven sisters school is you have blinds in your windows. There are no curtains. You have to make if you want curtains, you make curtains. What do you do? You go down to the local store that sells Indian tapestries is what they call them even though they're not tapestries you make them into curtains and so you know and then you you know people are inspired by that kind of fashion so you can see and you can see that there's another quilt in the iqm collection that i would also very much like to take and i think you can see this in the next slide this one I might have to fight you for because I, <laughs> this, I am I love embroidery. That's what led Isn't me to quilts. And um, we actually have a pair of these, and the embroidery is so fabulous. And um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this was clearly done by professionals the whole way. I mean, I think so. Yeah. And but look at the beautiful colors. And if you go to the next slide, you can really get a, a better sense of how this is also an example of the the Chinese design. So if you go to slide eleven. Yeah, see, you can see the same thing. But notice how the background is very densely quilted. And then you look and there's that gorgeous embroidery. And again, you can see um, the dogs, the little, the little dancing dogs. Those could be European, but the birds look oh, very good. The birds big. are so crazy. And the detail in them is amazing. Absolutely. And it's just... and the. The thing that impresses me is how bright and fresh the colors still are, because a lot of the time, I mean, some of the pinks are a bit faded, but most of them are that bright, bright cochineal blue red. And even, I mean, even some of the greens look, look good, which is really you know, that's, that's true. Really, that's a, really exceptional to have the greens look so vibrant. Yeah, because so many of the, you know, the, the yellow of the green isn't as light fast as the indigo blue and it starts to fade out and you end up with something that's kind of bluish green looking. 
Um, I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful piece. I mean, if you go to the next slide, they even have a little Paris. That the remember, do you have the guy with the umbrella in the first quilt? <clears throat> Look, another parasol. Isn't that great? But I, but you know, again, this you can see that the workmanship is just spectacular i mean look at the stitching in that look at the colors and look at i mean look at how fresh that looks it's just it's just beautiful but again there's that sort of exotic mysterious east i mean you've got although it's interesting you see the the, the attendant it makes me think of all of, this just suddenly occurred to me you know the attendant is much shorter than the figure that he's holding up the parasol for. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, well, what was popular in Europe around then? They had to stand this fashion for keeping court dwarfs wow. as, as court jesters. And it was particularly, you know, particularly popular a few years earlier, but a lot of European courts at that time period, they would, if they heard about, you know, a, a child with dwarfism being born, they would bring them to court and have them be part of the royal attendants. Wow. And they would, you know, a lot, some of them were raised to the nobility, lived a much better life than they would have wow. uh, outside, but at the same time, they were like the court freak. So well, unfortunately, yes, very um, sad. I'm really curious. What do you think is the impetus for that center medallion that we just see over and over and over again in these early quilts? Why is that such an incredibly universal design element? Well, it's easy to say that it was because this is what they did with the Indo-Portuguese quilts, but not only Indo-Portuguese quilts have a central medallion. I mean, the one that Dana F Bone found up in Spokane very definitely does not. It's much more of an all-over design. I mean, I think she did she did some she showed she did a diagram showing the motifs. It doesn't have a central motif. I'm not sure if it was simply copying what was more common. Or if it was just, it it might have had something to do with, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just spitballing this. But it might be that a lot of the time you would see portraits on the wall. And a lot of the portraits of that time period were round or oval. So maybe that had something to do with it. They were used to seeing, you know, like a round central image um, the embroidered quilt, that was, well, when was that from, Carolyn? I think it's in early 1700s. Yeah, quilt. I think that um, was like 1720, 17. Yes, and I think it's it's another English example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, by that, by that time period, you're starting to see more, um, more Europeans starting to create these works on their own. I mean, there's there there's been some di dispute about a bunch of silk whole cloth quilts that, you know, that mm, they originally were identified as as also coming from India, from coming from Bengal, and then um, Margaret Lids at Winterthur thought that they were from Greek. They were from the Greek island of Chios. Right. And then Catherine Berenson has been disputing the date on that. And then there was another, um, then there was another paper recently that said, no, no, they probably were Greek or Italian. And I mean, there's still a lot of dispute about those, but they definitely were seen to have been made somewhere in the Mediterranean basin. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see, you know, a lot of, um, you know there were native quilt industries. I mean, the, obviously there was the white the white quilt industry in Marseille. And again, Catherine Berenson is the expert. Oh yeah, she's amazing. But they definitely were, you know, there were there were copies or quilts inspired by this type of quilting in Spain and Portugal. Um, there are references to quilts being, you know, France obviously did some. Um, there were quilts being made in England. Oh, you know, know, I, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say we um we just discovered a, an early twentieth century um group of quilts from Italy, northern Italy, that are whole cloth silks, oh all done um with these beautiful quilting designs. That Ooh. um Jonathan Holstein happened to be living in that area and found one family with them, and subsequently we have about a dozen of them that are you know, no longer being made. They were um, a dowry item, perhaps, 
and they've just mm-hmm. kind of gone out of style. But I do think that Mediterranean connection is such an intriguing one. And exactly, we yeah. don't really, we really can't pinpoint a lot of these details because we really need some more systematic studying of all oh, the objects. Except for except for Catherine doing her work on the on the French quilts, there's been very very little work yeah. on like quilts in Italy. Um, you know, I. I mean, I ended up writing um, a paper that got into Meaning for Clothing and Textiles 8, and I ended up writing a paper on a 1477 um, patchwork cushion that was found in a tomb in um, at, right after World War II. And the Italians had known about this for years. I was the first person to write on it in English. And you really can't see this too well but it's it you know it's it's um i'd be more than happy to talk to anybody about this for hours if i if you gave me a chance but there hasn't been all that much work on quilts or patchwork or anything even related to it in yeah. europe and oh by the way something i just noticed about this absolutely about this beautiful quilt on screen this again it looks like there's an additional added border because if you look at it, the color of the cloth is slightly different. And, you know, um, I was going to point out that both of our examples, and um, they're so intriguing to me because they came into the collection at different times, but they are very much done in sections. And you yes, can see yes. how they are seamed together. So yes. it would have been put on as an entire embroidered border already. And it, and it does, and it it sort of matches. But you it's can sort tell of it imagine. Was, it yeah, was, it's not exact. It in a different style and by different people and using different cloth. Yes. So it they might have just come from wherever they were originally made and they weren't big enough for the local for the bed. And so the lady of the house or the merchant who was re- who was selling this piece, you know. I mean, the, the, how, the, the, um, I also noticed that this one looks like it's bound in um, just a plain cu- plain cloth. I think it's a it might even be a yellow silk that's wrapped from the back around because we can't really see the back of the quilt because the backing is just a, a large piece of yellow um, silk. Okay, so you can't oh, see so how the oh, okay. quilting okay. goes through. Okay. And um. Tara, if you can go down to the lower corners, the other thing that was really just strange about these pieces is you can see that the design stops and the corner is left open. Like it might have been meant to be finished and for a, a cutout four poster bed, but they never completed it. And that's the same with both of those quilts. Yeah, no, I know. So why would I they know. leave the corner like that, just unfinished? Yeah, no, that's you. You see that sometimes in quilts in New England too. Um, I know Lynn Bassett's done a lot of work on those, uh, but you know, you'll often see like a square cut out of the corner or you'll, or I've seen, I mean, I, it would almost make sense to have a slit cut as well for the four poster. Yeah. Because I know four poster beds were really popular in upper class households at that time period. But no, the, but no, I, you know, that is, it, it looks like maybe, who. Looks like oh, and it looks like it actually cut into the into the into the original medallion too. And see, you can see that that little there's a little chunk right there that looks like it got cut out. And isn't that a shame? But, it's a- they're just such an, um, the thing that I found was so amazing with the two quotes that we have is that the there are elements that are different, but the overall formatting, the way they were put together, yeah. they, they really do make you think of, of some kind of a workshop or professional shop that would have made these because they're so similar. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's the kind of thing that, you know, as a museum, we try to do is to acquire additional examples of things in the collection mm-hmm. because you hope through comparison or just putting all those numbers together that you can really start to learn from them. Oh yeah. That yeah. Carolyn Miller saying maybe bed hangings. And I'm like that, you know, the upper, that top part could have been, you know, like the valance around the, around the very top of a bed, because often in the old inventories, you'll see a reference to the bed furnishings and they'll mean the tester 
and the and the balance the the balances and then That's another you know the whole and, and the bed and the bed curtains and everything else so it could be you know again recycling these into something new it, we see it happen a lot with these really exquisite textiles exactly. um, Lisa, i hate to do this um we are down to only about 10 minutes and mm -hmm. you've got a few more slides um so yeah. let's get through your slides and then um we i, I have lots of questions for you but oh, we'll go see ahead. What we can do too. Yeah. yeah ask away oh yeah there's the there's the lovely little parasol who could ask for more and then those were my those were my ancestors the unanswered questions about my future decorative item you know again we already covered that why is the border so different was it made by a professional or an amateur or would the border and the medallion made at different times or by different people i mean you know you would need to do more research and and also i have to you know i you know, it's one of those things where, you know, which one would I actually steal? Um, because, you know, neutrals go with everything. But look at all those pretty colors. I, I know an aunt of mine, her favorite colors were, and I'm not joking about this. Her favorite colors were beige, bone, and taupe. <laughs> My hand to God. The woman loved beige and taupe. She liked oh, her neutrals. Oh, boy, did she like her neutrals. And I don't think she ever understood why I liked brighter, bolder colors. Oh, it does. Oh, oh, Dana's trying yeah, to come. How nice. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, okay. It does have a small central medallion. So, okay. I stand corrected. I hadn't actually looked at that issue of the uncoverings in a, in a while. So I just remember that it had more of like the seed pod motifs in it, which, you know, which isn't very common, but yeah. Well, it, it's just fascinating to me. Um, and I would encourage people, um, we did do, um, we showed all of our early quilts in an exhibition called Old World Quilts. Mm -hmm. And Tara will put that link up um, and you can go to it on our um, website and you can see all of our early quilts and you can zoom in and really get up close and personal with us. Yeah. And I tried to just I, of course, I wasn't doing new research. I was just gathering what was out there and trying to put things together. So I, one of the ways we did the exhibition was to show common elements. So we, mm -hmm. we did a little symbol for each one. And the medallion, of course, was one of those, the use of yellow silk, all of these things. And, and you know, tried to kind of put together what was similar and what was very different. And we showed pieces from all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. We we had a palimpore with that pelican on it. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Young from the Netherlands. Um, we had uh, just some really stunning pieces, but the center medallion was just so prevalent from you all of those, and it was such a an and interesting revelation to see that and yeah. wonder, you know, and and of course we know that some um, of these design elements are universal and they cross time and place, yep. and it's something about the the way we perceive them maybe is is satisfying to the eye or something because they they just come from all of these different cultures. Yeah. yeah, I mean humans like symmetry. You know, you see it in one form or another in you know culture after culture and style after style. You'll see, you know, a center design of some sort and then you know, you know, uh, basically symmetrical designs to either side of it. You see it everywhere. And it's only in the modern times that you'll see that you're seeing more asymmetrical or more scattershot designs. And even then, people keep coming back to what's symmetrical, to what's even. And, you know, again, central medallions, you see them, you still see them being made today. Well, I mean, if you think about it, it lasted all the way well up into the, the mid 1800s in our early quilts our English and American quilts, mm -hmm. we still had the center medallion. And um, it wasn't until the block style really kind of took over yeah. that, and, and even in the early block, um, the early pieced quilts, um, Janice yeah. Frisch did some great research for us for our um, book, American Quilts in the Industrial Age. And she really looked at the development of block style quilts. And even within them, there was a center medallion. There was that yeah. center focus of, of how they use their color and design. And it's so intriguing. And look how many even pieced quilts will have a different border. You know, you'll have a different border with, you know, like um, a different quilting design or, you know, prairie points or something like that. And it's not quite a central medallion, but you'll still see the border. 
right. or that drops over the side of the bed is going to be in a different design. And that's, you know, you'd see that over and over and over yeah. again. So, well, Lisa, um, in our last couple of minutes, I was so intrigued by your, um, in your bio where you were talking about your current research and the, the comparison oh. of clothing and quilts. Or, yes. Tell okay. us a little bit more about that. Okay. And this is something that I'm still, it's still very preliminary work, but I am finding the more I look at clothing, particularly in Germany and Italy, but I found a couple examples other places. But if you look through the paintings of, you know, like from maybe from around 1470 to 1480 to about 1540, you keep seeing, um, you keep seeing what look like patchwork designs and pieced clothing, you know, clothing in long strips. Or you'll see there's a set of frescoes from around 1500 that's in um, that's in um, that's in a, um, a monastery in Italy. It shows the life of Saint Benedict, and the soldiers of the of Saint Benedict's great opponent Attila the Hun. They call him Totilla, but it's really Attila the Hun. Are wearing these wild looking piece doublets and hose, and they have things like long vertical stripes, they have checkerboards. They one of them in the hose, the, the, he's wearing this very tight fitting pair of hose, and the area that is right over his um, right buttock is all pieced clamshells. Wow, and we have one or two examples of surviving hose, and they're definitely pieced. This isn't printed or embroidered or woven these are pieced and wow. i recently this was the the subject of my of my article for blanket statements and it is a there's a there's a 1512 um wedding outfit that was worn by the man who later became um a you know the ruler of saxony in germany and the description is it was very it was it was composed of several hundred pieces all sewn together in four colors yellow re rosy red ash color which would be probably gray and white some areas were made were made to look like dice and others looked like a checkerboard and it gives the dimensions and everything else and it was written by the duke by duke henry the pious's secretary um wow who was, you know, who had the, this name, like, I think it was Bernard Dernflinger, or something that's terribly, terribly medieval German. And the, unfortunately, the wedding portrait that we have of Henry does not show him wearing that. It shows him wearing something that's slash, which is the other big design style of that time period. But I talked to the, to the curator of the Royal Armory in Dresden, who found this diary, and she said, oh, well, there's a reason for that. And when in the Saxon royal weddings took place over two days and they would wear different outfits on one day and uh, they would wear one outfit on the first day and the other outfit on the second day. And this elaborately pieced outfit was probably worn on the second day because in the first, you know, the one and he chose to be, poor, to be painted in the outfit where if you look very closely at it, you'll see that a lot of the the garment that where, you know, the outer layer is slashed to show you what's underneath. The stuff that's underneath is cloth of gold, which would have been very much more expensive than anything pieced. So you showed that off by slashing yeah. it and seeing exactly. that underneath. And it would be kind of, and it would be very glittery and very fancy under torchlight, you know, and I'm just starting to work on that, but, you know, well, I, if, I you know, know but it's it, but you know I also found some references to what they called pained quilts, which were quilts that were pieced of long strips of cloth in Henry VIII's inventories, and one of them had six colors, and it sounds like a Joseph's coat strippy. Boy, we we have a lot more research to do, don't we? I, I think it's just so fascinating. You have really just delved into such early um, items and we don't really know much about them at all. So I'm really excited yeah. to see what you come up with next. And Lisa, you have to come to Nebraska and study our quilts. I want oh, you to come to and tell thank us you. about our quilts. I we have, we have great information that came from some, um, Jane Lurie, um, some of the people, like you said, Lynn Bassett. Um, we have a great yeah. um, Marseille collection from Catherine yeah. Barrington. So we have some good, solid information, but there are still so many mysteries left. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As the, the one thing I've realized as I learn more and more and study more and more and track down more and more is I don't know nearly as much as I should. <laughs> and the I more would, you know, the more you need to know. But I would love to come to Nebraska at some point, and I would love to come back and do another quilt side chat at some point. That would be fun. This is well, and, you know, um, we're showing one of our, um, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year with three different exhibitions in our evolving, um, I can't even remember the name of our show now, the, our evolving, our 25th anniversary shows. Maren mm -hmm. Hansen, my colleague, has worked on some of our international pieces mm -hmm. and she's showing one of our beautiful red silk Italian whole cloths. So oh. her show will go up here in about three weeks. And you'll be able to zoom in and see that quilt. Yeah. So we'll look for that coming up. It's an evolving vision. And um, so you'll be able to get a little taste of one. And maybe yeah. that'll be enough to lure you to Nebraska. Probably first, probably fly out to Omaha and then drive south. But That's the best way to do it. Cheapest mm -hmm. way to get here. So, exactly. oh, gosh, so we, are, we are at our time. Yeah. And this has just been so much fun. And I That's am... Great. I love those early pieces so much. And I just think that there is a wealth of information out there that we are going to be able to draw from. And hopefully in the next years, you're going to really inspire a lot more people to look at those early well, images, those early pieces. You know, it kind of, it kind of gets lonely being the only, being one of the very few who's looking into this, but I would love it if more people, you know, if more people have questions, let me know, you know, or let, you know, you can, you know, get in touch with you and, you know, you pass the questions along to me and um, I would love to come back at some point and I definitely would want to get to Nebraska. All right. Well, we will plan on that, Lisa. Thank you everybody for being with us today. This has been such an amazing conversation and um, we look forward to April 24th when our next um, quilt side chat is with Zania Cord and we're going to be talking mm. about a quilt that I did some research on. Um, with Zania kind of inspired me and I used a lot of her early research to build on in my um, PhD research. So um, mm. an 1840s um, inscribed piece from the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia. So mm. I love the story so we're going to have another great chat in april and i hope you all can join us then so thank you for being here everybody and thank you so much lisa you're welcome and thank you for thank you for having me bye everybody bye bye